Yeah, um, we could, I'll, we'll start introducing the next speaker, who's Dr. Donald Abrams from uh, the USA. And to introduce him, I'll ask uh, Marlon, Marlon again to come up. Marlon Gurman, thanks. So today was actually supposed to be Donald's grand finale. He was scheduled. He was scheduled to be. He was scheduled to testify at the trial of the plant. Um, but here he is today, and this will be Donald's grand introduction because unfortunately he has to go back to San Francisco today. This case, the state was so scared of his words that they stalled the beginning of the trial so, got, so Don couldn't testify. He has authored thousands, hundreds of, of, of chapters and papers and been at the forefront of cannabis research for decades. Even though Donald didn't make it to the stand, Don Mahan mentioned a study that Donald had done and the effectiveness of using cannabis to treat peripheral neuropathy in HIV. Studies like this one inspired me to travel to San Francisco to try and recruit Donald to help millions of people living with, HI with HIV to access cannabis as medicine. Now Donald is an oncologist who is also trained in integrative medicine. He treats cancer but he also treats people. As an oncologist working in San Francisco in the 1960s, he was on the front lines of the disease when the epidemic broke out and when the, the National Institutes of Health were, were looking for a name for the, for the agent that causes the AIDS virus, it was Donald who suggested human immunodeficiency virus, HIV a name which many South Africans know too well. He doesn't work with HIV anymore. He's here to educate us about cannabis and cancer and one of the, one of the most feared diagnoses of our time. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the man who was kept away from the stand all the way from the United States. Please welcome the good Donald, Donald Abrams. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, finally I get to appear. It's very frustrating and bittersweet to uh, sit in that courtroom for those days and not actually be able to do anything. Well, I did something, I suppose. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk to you a bit about cannabis and cancer care. And I'd like to start by telling you how I really got involved in this in the first place. Uh, in 1981, I was studying to be an oncologist at the University of California, San Francisco, when AIDS came out of the blue and we didn't know what it was or what to do about it. So I became a champion of alternative therapies, even when there was no conventional therapy to be alternative to. And then when we got our first conventional therapy, you might remember AZT, I said, ooh, this isn't very good. So I wrote all the chapters in all the AIDS textbooks on complementary and alternative therapies. And then in 1992, Rick Doblin, the president and founder of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, a graduate of the Harvard School of uh, Government, uh, PhD, working uh, to fight the war against the war on drugs, uh, challenged me to study cannabis as a treatment for the AIDS wasting syndrome, which was a very difficult problem at that time. And I said, okay, I can do that. I went to college in the 60s. So I fought our government for quite some time and ultimately I was awarded a million dollars and 1,400 of our government's best cannabis cigarettes to do research. And that really changed my life because it gave me a very strong appreciation of the power of plants as medicine. And that then took me to the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado. A month after I had done my first ever jury duty and came home and said, I want to go to law school. But in Telluride, I met Andrew Weil, the guy with the white beard that looks like 
Father Christmas, the sort of founder of integrative medicine, and he described a two-year online distance learning fellowship you could do with his program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. So I said, uh-huh, I don't want to go to law school. I want to do that. And it changed my life. When I finished, I said, I'm done with HIV AIDS. I've done this for 25 years, and it's very different from when I started, thankfully. What I want to do now is integrative oncology, working with people living with and beyond cancer and helping them to combine complementary therapies with conventional cancer care. And so cannabis changed my life in many ways. So my goals today are really to review uh, some of the uh, information we have with regards to cannabis in cancer care, uh, to describe the potential utility of cannabis in some of the uh, problems related to treatment uh, of cancer, and then to summarize the data regarding cannabis and the risk of cancer, as well as to review possible ways that cannabinoids themselves may have direct anti-cancer effect. Now, this is an interesting uh, exhumation of the Siberian ice princess, dated to be 2,700 years old and very well preserved. In fact, people are studying her tattoos to figure out exactly what they mean. The ice princess has uh, undergone MRI testing, and it's been uh, ascertained that she was a young woman in her 20s who died of metastatic breast cancer. And around her uh, person, she had a belt that contained a pouch in which were the flowers of the female plant of cannabis sativa. So this suggested to the archaeologist or anthropologist, whoever does this work, that this woman perhaps was using cannabis as a treatment of her symptoms of her cancer or perhaps even for treatment of her cancer itself. Now, I'm not an archaeologist or an anthropologist, but if every person in the tribe were buried with that same pouch of cannabis, then that sort of makes that hypothesis a little less emphatic. And I think this is one of the problems we have today, or I have with my patients living with and cancer, with and beyond cancer, who get most of their information online, that they tend to make very big jumps. But back to cancer, symptoms that we see in patients are, are numerous and difficult to treat. Weight loss, cachexia, early satiety, uh, uh, anorexia, uh, pain, nausea, anxiety. All of these things are things that we see in our patients. And just in thinking about what we've heard already this morning, you appreciate that there is one medicine that we can actually recommend uh, that will cover pretty much uh, all of those uh, symptoms. What do we know about uh, appetite? Anandamide, which uh, Marlon talked so eloquently about, in low concentrations in mice leads to a potent enhancement of appetite. And the CB1 receptors are implicated in the control of food intake by where they're located. And those mice that have a CB1 receptor knocked out not only don't benefit from THC, but they eat less than normal uh, mice in their litter. So it's felt that the CB1 receptors are involved directly in motivational and reward aspects of eating. And we also know that mother's milk has a high concentration of the other endocannabinoid, 2-AG. And so scientists uh, did some uh, studies where they gave a CB1 antagonist. That is something that blocks the receptor so it cannot combine with the 2-AG. And they found that those mice, if given within 24 hours of birth, actually stopped suckling and died. So this led uh, many pharmaceutical companies uh, to look at CB1 receptor antagonists as a treatment for overweight or obesity. And in an early phase clinical trial, uh, yes, people who were given uh, the CB1 antagonist, which ultimately was licensed and approved in most of the European Union, a drug called Ramonabant, uh, they did lose uh, significant weight. So Manuel Guzman is my colleague in Madrid uh, who's a PhD who studies the anti-cancer effects of cannabinoids uh, in test tubes. And at a meeting once, I said to him, Manuel, how is that drug doing in Europe? And he said, Donald, would you block your CB1 receptor? Because when you block the CB1 receptor, 
you may decrease food intake, but you also decrease the ability to experience pleasure, and you increase anxiety, and basically you create a syndrome of melancholic depression. So in fact, uh, after a number of months uh, available in Europe, and many patients in the United States were quite aggravated with our Food and Drug Administration for not approving this as a drug for weight loss, the drug was taken off the market because blocking the CB1 receptor not only increased depression, but increased suicide in patients. And that's quite a, quite a price to pay for weight loss, right? So what do we know about cannabis? The earliest study was done in the 1970s, and they put two groups of three adult men in a residential facility for 13 days. And for the first half of the day, they had to stay in the room working and they were allowed to socialize together for the second part of the day. And they smoked two cigarettes containing what we would consider today very low potency THC or placebo during both the private and social parts of the day. When they smoked the actual cannabis, their caloric intake increased 40% during both the isolated and the socializing period. And the caloric intake was due to an increase in snacks, not in meals and particularly sweet solid items, not sweet liquids or savory solids were consumed. And this is basically the data that still exists today on the effect of cannabis on appetite. Let me backtrack for a moment and explain why it is so difficult to study the plant, particularly in my country. In the United States, despite the fact that 29 states have now approved cannabis for medical use, and eight for recreational use, the government still considers it a Schedule One substance with high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. And the only legal source of cannabis to do research with is our National Institute on Drug Abuse. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse has a mandate from our Congress that they can only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So if you want to study cannabis for its therapeutic benefit, you, can, you must get the cannabis from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, but they cannot give you the funds to do the research, which in our country is quite expensive. So that's why if you look at the literature on cannabis and the effects of cannabis, most of the literature funded by grants from our National Institute on Drug Abuse are looking at harm and not benefit. On the other hand, dronabinol, which is Delta 9 THC that's been synthesized and put in sesame oil, has been licensed and approved for treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting and wasting syndrome associated with HIV uh, for 30 years now. But the data is not particularly impressive on the ability of dronabinol to increase weight in cancer patients. In this study, which compared dronabinol to a, bro a progestational agent that's used to increase appetite, the magestrol actually increased appetite and weight more so than the dronabinol. And when dronabinol was added to the progestational agent, it actually was less effective than it was when it was taken alone. So that is the largest study that's published. And again, it's not looking at cannabis. It's looking at Delta 9 THC. And as we've heard this morning, about the entourage effect, that there are so many other chemical compounds in the plant. I say at least 100 other cannabinoids and probably 400 other chemicals that all provide the plant uh, with more benefit than you get from the single molecule of Delta 9 THC, which has been uh, pharmacologically associated. Now, we've heard a lot about CBD or cannabidiol. And I will tell you, I was recently a member of the 16 uh, in member panel uh, created by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in the United States to review the health effects of uh, cannabis and cannabinoids. And our charge was to look at all the published literature since the last time this was reviewed in 1999 
and particularly the studies that we looked at were not individual studies, but aggregate analyses of individual studies, so-called meta-analyses or systematic reviews. And if we couldn't find a meta-analysis or systematic review, then we looked at individual studies. And I will tell you at this point in time, there are very few clinical trials published in the medical literature that actually look at CBD alone. And one of the biggest challenges for me today as an oncologist who sees a lot of patients who ask me a lot of questions about CBD and THC is what is the right ratio of CBD to THC in the product that they're acquiring at the dispensary and could they just treat this condition with CBD alone and not THC? So there was a study that was done in the Netherlands where they just asked people using different strains of cannabis that are available in the Netherlands which work best for their appetite. And they found that the a group that had 6% THC and 7.5% CBD, so a higher CBD concentration than THC, reported less anxiety and dejection, but also less appetite stimulation. So it does appear that THC, because again it binds with the CB1 receptor, which CBD does not, may be necessary to increase appetite. So as I mentioned, uh, oral Delta 9 THC was initially licensed and approved in the United States in 1986 for treatment of nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Interestingly, the indication was expanded to treatment of AIDS uh, wasting syndrome in 1992. But if you look carefully at this advertisement, it's telling you that in the placebo-controlled clinical trial, the Delta 9 THC did not increase weight in the patients with wasting syndrome, but it increased appetite. So why would the government approve a drug that only increased appetite and not weight? Well, up until 1992, our federal government, despite the fact that they say there is no apparent medical use for cannabis, was providing a small handful of patients with so-called orphan diseases with a canister of 300 cannabis cigarettes a month. And they got concerned that patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome, who numbered in the thousands to tens of thousands, still could be considered an orphan drug uh, group. And they thought that these people would be knocking on their door to get 300 cigarettes a month. So in 1992, Bush 1 closed the so-called compassionate use program that was providing these patients with cannabis. And the FDA expanded the indication for dronabinol to include anorexia or loss of appetite associated with AIDS, although it didn't increase weight. So what do we know about cannabis and chemotherapy reduce, induced nausea and vomiting? So in the 70s, I was in, in my medical training and started my training to be a cancer specialist. And we didn't have many effective pharmaceutical anti-nausea drugs. And a lot of young people who had cancers, particularly Hodgkin's disease and testicular cancer, cancers of young people that we still treat today with the same highly nauseating chemotherapy that we used back in the 70s, told us, you know what? You can keep your prescription anti-nausea medicine. Inhaling cannabis works a lot better. And so in the randomized trials, the oral THC, the dronabinol and nabilone, were both found to be better than placebo and equivalent to the only other available anti-nausea medicine on the market at that time. Smoke THC appeared better than the oral, but if we had to line up THC with the other currently available anti-nausea medicines, it would not necessarily be the most potent. So these are some of those so-called meta-analyses. There were 30 randomized trials done looking at various cannabinoids, Delta 9 THC, especially no clinical trials included looked at cannabis. And again, these studies concluded that the Delta 9 THC was more effective than placebo and as effective as other licensed drugs. So currently, the, the main drug that we use now uh, for nausea in chemotherapy is a drug called Ondansetron which is a serotonin inhibitor that causes a lot of constipation. 
And cancer patients are not enthusiastic about constipation because if you feel that you're dying, you feel that constipation is evidence that one of your functions is, is going and, and they don't like that. But in this clinical trial of, again, dronabinol uh, versus uh, uh, ondansetron, it appeared that it was, again, as effective as one of the uh, currently widely available anti-nausea medicines that we use. So this is uh, one of the slides issued by the government uh, from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine when we reviewed the potential therapeutic uh, effects of cannabis, uh, the conclusions were that in adults with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, oral cannabinoids are effective anti-emetics or anti-nausea agents. So only oral, what about cannabis? There are only three published trials in the medical literature looking at cannabis in chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And in two, cannabis was only made available after the Delta-9 THC failed. So if the single most active component failed, it's not likely that the plant itself is going to work, and it didn't. And the third was a, a small study in only 20 patients, which produced results that I think are very difficult to interpret. Now, nabiximols is a pharmaceutically produced whole plant extract using the whole plant, but effectively modulating it so it has a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC, and it's sprayed under the tongue. And in a small study of 16 patients with cancer, an average of five sprays of nabiximols was better than five sprays of placebo at further reducing nausea. But again, I've been an oncologist in San Francisco now for 34 years. And I say that I need a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial to tell me cannabis is effective in nausea and vomiting, like I need a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial to tell me that penicillin is an antibiotic. This is just a... <clears throat> This is a, an example of one of the many emails I get. This is from a 48-year-old gentleman with metastatic colon cancer contacting me to see about getting an extension for the medical marijuana letter you issued me last year, which expired on March 21st. Although I did not use it until my last five sessions of chemo, me getting over the stigma of its use, it did what no other drug could do, completely solve the severe nausea that I had. It allowed me to play with my children, attend their sports and school activities, and just function very normally in day-to-day -day activities. I cannot thank you enough for giving me that option. I am currently on a chemo vacation after a clean scan, and the only time I use medical marijuana now is when I have trouble sleeping. I would like to continue to use it for that purpose instead of relying on pharmaceutical options. And of course, I renewed his letter. We did have Melissa Etheridge, who's a famous singer in the United States come out and say that the only way she was able to tolerate her adjuvant treatment for her, her adjuvant chemo for her breast cancer was by using inhaled cannabis. Now we just heard uh, from Tony about uh, the acids, the, those compounds that are present in the plant before it's combusted, uh, particularly THCA and uh, CBDA. And in animal models, these non-psychoactive uh, precursors to THC and CBD seem to suppress nausea and vomiting. Neither one of them actually uh, complexes with the CB1 receptor and hence they're not psychoactive. And in animal studies, THCA is felt to be at least 10 times more potent than actual THC in acute nausea and anticipatory nausea. And the uh, cannabidiol acid is even more potent than CBD in suppressing uh, anticipatory nausea, the nausea that comes when patients are getting ready to go for chemotherapy. So uh, again, oops, hang on. So that, uh, 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 supporting what uh, Tony just mentioned, uh, it is a reason that cannabis juicing uh, may be useful. So this uh, sort of recapitulates what Marlon told us, that the endocannabinoids are synthesized on demand from cell membranes and then metabolize when the work that they are doing is done. And when the endocannabinoids complex with the CB1 receptor, they lead to changes in the cell that in, 
that uh, in, in, interacts with appetite, immune function, muscle, pain, intraocular pressure, emesis, etc. And when the endocannabinoids complex with the CB2 receptor, as Marlon uh, pointed out so well, they may impact immune function as well as cell division, inflammation, and again, pain. And we know that the uh, endocannabinoids can also complex with the so-called vanilloid receptor, and you see pain there as well. And then the uh, as yet unidentified cannabinoid receptors, it's postulated that pain may also be impacted. In fact, it's felt that one of the reasons that we and all other animal species have this system of endocannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors is to help us modulate the experience of pain. Michael Pollan, who's a journalist in Berkeley, uh, in his book, The Botany of Desire, suggests that the reason we have the system is to help us to forget. So while I'm standing here talking to you, I'm not remembering where I parked my car at the airport or when the last time I gave this talk is, so I could be here now. And when you replace your endocannabinoids with the plant cannabinoids, you forget to forget, and everything is, wow, a new experience. So in his second book, uh, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, uh, he's trying to gather his own food uh, for a year. And he's crouched in the woods with a rifle on his shoulder, waiting for a deer to shoot. And he said, you know what, this is painful. And then he postulates that the reason that we and all other animal species that are dependent on preying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, for sustenance, have the system of cannabinoids and endocannabinoid receptors is to help us to forget pain. So we know that there are elevated levels of the cannabinoid receptor, similar to the opioid receptor, found in areas of the brain that modulate processing of noxious stimuli or stimuli that cause pain. And also things that complex with CB1 and CB2 also have action in the peripheral nervous system as well as in the brain. And we know that cannabinoids may also have anti-inflammatory effects. So the pain relieving effects of cannabinoids are not blocked if you block the opiate system. If you give THC intravenously, which is not particularly recommended, it really is a potent pain reliever, but there's a lot of psychoactivity. So it appears that cannabinoids, like opiates, are involved in our modulation of pain. And nerve pain or neuropathic pain is something that's very difficult for us to treat without getting people dependent on opiates. So in the rat model of neuropathic pain, which is a so-called rat tail flick, uh, model, you put a rat's tail on a hot plate, and the longer it can stay there in response to a pharmacologic intervention, the more likely it is that that intervention will work in neuropathic pain. So cannabinoids work in neuropathic pain, and that led us to do a clinical trial to look at whether or not uh, cannabis itself was effective in patients with HIV-related peripheral neuropathy. Now, how did I do a study of that? when the government won't fund it. Well, at the end of the last century, California, the state, had a budget surplus. And one of our state legislatures appropriated $3 million a year for three years to establish a Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the University of California, my home institution. So that center had funds to fund clinical trials that were looking at the potential therapeutic benefit of uh, cannabis. So we published in the August journal Neurology the results of our study looking at cannabis in painful HIV-associated sensory neuropathy. And this was, in fact, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. We started with 16 patients that we admitted to our General Clinical Research Center uh, for nine days. And for seven days, they inhaled uh, the government's finest 3.5% THC cigarettes three times a day. And we concluded that that did have an effect on their pain. So from that, we calculated the number of patients we needed to enroll in a follow-on randomized placebo-controlled trial. <clears throat> but I was working with colleagues at the Pain Clinical Research Center 
at, San, at the University of California, San Francisco, and they said, Donald, since you're studying such a controversial substance, let's do an experimental pain model. So in addition to asking patients about what happened to their nerve damage pain in their hands and feet, we also created pain by heating their skin to 40 degrees Celsius with a thermode, and then on top of that, applying capsaicin cream. Capsaicin, the active ingredient in red hot chili peppers. And this creates an area of weird feeling and hypersensitivity around that rectangle that we can then measure with the person looking off in another direction with a piece of foam and a brush. So this gives us, again, a more objective measurement of the patient's pain. So these are the results. We asked patients to keep a pain diary uh, of their nerve pain, rating it from zero to 100 for a week before we admitted them to our inpatient unit. And then before we started the study, because we were changing their lifestyle by putting them in this inpatient unit, we just allowed them to equilibrate for two days. And then for five days, half of the patients smoked the cannabis three times a day, and the other half smoked uh, the placebo. And the bottom line is the effect of the cannabis on reducing pain. You can see it's better, at least twice as good as the placebo. And then when they left the hospital, we said, please don't use cannabis for a week and continue to fill out the pain diary. And you can see those patients that benefited uh, went back to baseline. In the upper left is the curve showing what happened after smoking the first cigarette in the trial. And what we saw is the placebo group reported a 19% reduction in their pain compared to a 72% reduction in the group smoking cannabis. And that was highly statistically significant for the difference. The bottom two curve shows what happens to that area of weird feeling and hypersensitivity. Uh, the top line is what happened to the area in the placebo group, and the bottom line shows what happened in the group that inhaled the real cannabis. Again, they had a 30% reduction, and the placebo group increased. So we concluded from this study that smoked cannabis is in fact an effective treatment in patients with painful peripheral neuropathy. And it was also effective in the experimental pain model. The number of people that you need to treat for one to have a benefit in this study turned out to be 3.6, which is exactly the number needed to treat for the main anti-seizure medication that is currently being used as the main treatment uh, for uh, peripheral neuropathy. And then the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research funded four other studies in peripheral neuropathy, and they all have the same number needed to treat, and they all showed effect, which led Todd Micaria, who was one of our cannabis clinicians in the Bay Area, he, used, he collected these uh, bottles from 100 years ago uh, of cannabis medicines, and he sent me this after we published our paper saying, thank you for showing us what we've known for 100 years, that cannabis is effective in nerve pain, because that's what it used to be prescribed for. So chemotherapy also produces the same peripheral neuropathy. So where are studies showing that cannabis is useful in chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy? Well, we don't really have any yet, but we know from animals again that cannabis not only treats chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, but can actually protect the animals from developing it. So it seems like this is something that needs to be studied soon. There has been, again, a small study of nabiximols that under the tongue spray, one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD. Uh, again, only 16 patients. Uh, no, the top line shows no decrease in pain between the placebo or the nabiximols. But if they look at five people who seem to have a response, it may be worth pursuing further. I just read while I was here a, a headline from the US paper that we have two million opiate addicts in the United States. That actually seems a little low to me. But uh, it's a huge problem in our country, uh, addiction to opiates. And cannabinoids and opiates do share a number of pharmacologic properties. And originally, they were felt to work on the same pathways to produce uh, pharmacologic effects. 
but now we know that they don't. And again, in rodents, THC greatly enhances the pain relieving effects of morphine in a synergistic fashion, so that one plus one equals five and not two. And other opiates are also improved in their potency when given in conjunction with cannabinoids. So there's the possibility of getting enhanced and persistent analgesic effect at lower opiate doses. And this would be a very important thing to know. So I actually got funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse to study this. Why? Because I told them I was looking to see if it was safe for patients on a stable dose of sustained release morphine or sustained release oxycodone to add vaporized cannabis to their regimen. So as long as I'm looking for possible harm, the government said, okay, we'll fund it. So it's what we call my tro one of my Trojan horse studies. So as long as these patients had pain though, we were also gonna look at the effect on their pain. So since it was just a study looking at the pharmacokinetic interaction, that is what happens when you add cannabinoids to the plasma levels of the opiates in the bloodstream, you don't need a lot of participants. So we enrolled 10 people on morphine and 11 on oxycodone. <clears throat> and you can see their doses were 60 twice a day for the uh, morphine and 50 twice a day for the sustained release oxycodone. And we did ask if they had pain on the first day of their five-day study admission. And you can see the pain was slightly higher, 44, compared to 35 in the oxycodone group. So this is what happened to the levels of the plasma. On the left is the morphine, and the top line is at baseline, and the second line is after being exposed to vaporized cannabis three times a day. And if anything, it looks like the plasma level of the morphine is slightly decreased, but because the error bars cross, these are not statistically significant differences. On the right, you can see that the two curves for the oxycodone sustained release are entwined. So no change in the level of the oxycodone after adding vaporized cannabis. So if the level of the opiate stays the same or decreases, you would expect pain to stay the same or perhaps increase. But we, we found overall that on the first day, the average pain score was 40, and on the fifth day, it was down to 29. So that's a statistically significant reduction of about 25%. And the morphine group had a 33% reduction. But again, this study was not large enough to comment on these pain values. It's just a suggestion that it appears that co-administration may in fact have a beneficial effect in allowing people on stable doses of opiates to get more relief of pain and subsequently perhaps reduce their dose of opiates. Again, if you look back 100 years ago, morphine and cannabis were combined in an elixir. I think it's poison personally because of the chocolate. <laughs> so, one of the more common reasons lately that I'm recommending cannabis, we can't prescribe cannabis in the United States. We can only recommend it because prescribe means you take it to a drugstore and they're gonna give you a medicine and that's not really how it works. We write a letter of recommendation and the patients take it to one of the numerous cannabis dispensaries that we have and the dispensary discusses with them what they're treating and tells them what they have that may work best. Women treated with breast cancer, for breast cancer, have an increased risk of breast cancer if they continue to have their breasts. And the relationship between intake of alcohol and risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is linear. So I treat a lot of women who have survived breast cancer and they're back to work and they say, my colleagues wanna go out after work for a drink or my husband comes home and he suggests that we have a cocktail. And I would rather be relaxed but not expose myself to the toxicity of alcohol. And since I personally believe that cannabis is much more healthful for people than alcohol, I write these letters of recommendation without second thought. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> So 
So what about this question of smoking? It was mentioned, I, I believe, uh, by others this morning that smoking is dangerous. Well, in the United States, uh, tobacco use is quite low, uh, but still uh, there are uh, 167,000 cancer deaths uh, that are attributable to cigarette smoking each year in our country. So we, uh, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Committee, reviewed all of the meta-analyses looking to see is there an increased risk of lung cancer in patients smoking uh, who, cannabis. And we found, looking at uh, six uh, meta-analyses that included 6,000 patients, that there was little or no association between cannabis use and lung cancer. The other analysis is a famous study where they followed 50,000 Swedish uh, conscripts into the military for 40 years. Uh, they asked them about their cannabis use at age 18, and then 40 years later, checked to see if they had cancer without gathering any information about whether or not they used cannabis in the interval. And that did show an increased risk, but it did not control for use of tobacco. And that's a big gap of time, 40 years. If they haven't smoked cannabis and they have lung cancer, then maybe they breathe bad air. Uh, another cancer that people are concerned that smokers are going to be at increased risk for are cancers of the head and neck. And again, nine studies showed no association between use of cannabis and head and neck cancer. The only cancer that we found that might have an association with cannabis use is uh, non-seminomatous germ cell cancer or testicular cancer. But one of the problems there is who is most likely to get testicular cancer? Young men. And who smokes cannabis? Young men. So this association may be an association but doesn't necessarily imply cause because there's no biologic plausibility to why testicular cancer uh, should be associated with cannabis use. And we found no clear association with other cancers, including cancers in offspring of women or men who use cannabis prior to the birth of their child, which is reported in the medical literature. So what about this question? And again, as I am still a conventional oncologist. And we are the most reductionist of medical specialties because our goal is to reduce that cancer. And we demand the most evidence because we work with a very serious disease and we use very serious drugs. So my, my mentor, Andrew Weil, always says the degree of evidence should be directly proportional to the potential for the intervention to do harm. So if I'm going to say, I'm going to give you this chemo, your hair is going to fall out, you're going to vomit for three days, and your bone marrow is going to be suppressed, you're going to say, show me the evidence that it works. But if I'm going to say, eat more blueberries and get a massage twice a month, well, how much harm is that going to do, and how much evidence do I need to? But with this question of cannabis as an anti-cancer agent, I am looking for some evidence. And it all started in 1975 when investigators at our National Cancer Institute reported that in the test tube and in mice, Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 THC, and cannabidiol all inhibited growth of the Lewis lung adenocarcinoma cancer. And since that time, there's been an increasing body of preclinical evidence, meaning in test tubes in animals, suggesting that cannabinoids may, in fact, have activity against cancer. And we know that cannabis itself possesses antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, which are things that we look for to benefit our cancer patients. It's felt that there's a possible anti-tumor activity of the cannabinoid receptors inducing programmed cell death when they complex with the cannabinoids. So I mentioned Manuel Guzman, my dear friend in Madrid. Manuel's lab was working with looking at studying how cannabis affects metabolism. And the most highly metabolic cells in the human body are the brain cells. So they grew up cultures of brain and they added cannabinoids and they studied that. And they said, maybe we could do our work faster if we used brain tumor. So they grew up a mouse brain tumor cell line and they added cannabinoids and everything died. So they said, oh, we must have done something wrong. So they repeated the experiment and everything died. 
So they said, well, maybe it's bad cannabinoids. So they went back to the normal brain and they added the cannabinoids and everything lived. So this really has the best evidence that there's something going on. And as Marlin said, the CB1 receptor is the most densely populated receptor in the human brain. And when I ask colleagues, how many of you learned about that in medical school in a large audience like this, nobody raises their hand. Now, does that show you the extent of the ridiculousness of cannabis prohibition? That they don't teach us about the single most densely populated receptor in our brain? I mean, that's crazy. So we know that if you multiple tumor cell lines in the test tube are inhibited with cannabinoids. And in, in mice that don't have an immune system so that you can transplant human cancers into them, all of those different cancers can, in fact, be suppressed by cannabinoids. So in our review that we did for the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, we said we are not going to include any studies that are not done in human beings. But we had to include this information about cancer because there's so much interest and internet publicity about cannabinoids curing cancer. And what we found were 34 in the test tube studies and one human study. And in all the test tube studies, all but one showed that cannabinoids can selectively kill, and these are brain tumors in mice, those cells. And the anti-tumor activity is, again, through making the cells die and also decreasing the formation of new blood vessels, which feed tumors. And then it also decreases a protein called matrix metalloproteinase 2, which allows cancer cells to become invasive and spread through the body. So very impressive and very highly suggestive. The only human study of cannabinoids in cancer comes from my friend Manuel Guzman, who left Spain and went to the Canary Islands to do this clinical trial in nine patients with recurrent brain tumors, the most aggressive glioblastoma multiforme. And he actually dripped THC into their tumor cavities by way of a catheter. I said, Manuel, we don't treat cancer topically, usually. He said the treatment was well tolerated. There was no difference in survival compared to patients receiving chemotherapy alone. In the test tube, THC did inhibit the proliferation and decrease the viability of the glioblastoma cells from biopsies taken from those patients. And it was later demonstrated that adding cannabidiol enhanced the inhibitory effects of THC on the glioblastoma cell proliferation and survival. Recently published last year was this study looking at cannabinoid receptors in human tumors, something that I was trying to gear up to do but couldn't get funding and now somebody's done all the work so I don't need to do it. What does it mean? I don't know. Gliomas, both cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2 are expressed and particularly the CB2 receptor in high-grade tumors. In colon cancer, expression of the cannabinoid 2 receptor is associated with a poor prognosis in patients with advanced stage disease. However, uh, there's another one, uh, yeah, that in liver cancer, increased expression of both receptors is associated with an improved prognosis and survival. So this is a very exciting area, but as yet, we don't know how to interpret these findings. Now, here's another interesting study done by a friend and colleague in San Francisco. Triple negative breast cancer is the most aggressive breast cancer. And he found that those cells in the test tube increased uh, levels of something called ID helix lo loop helix proteins. And these proteins control the processes related to tumor progression. When he added cannabidiol, it down-regulated expression of that particular protein. Unfortunately, our media picked it up as saying that marijuana cures aggressive breast cancer. And there is a huge leap there. I mean, I often say as an AIDS doctor, I knew that soap suds and gasoline killed the virus in the test tube, but I wouldn't recommend either one of those as a treatment. And here, what happens to that protein expression in the test tube 
compared to the number of women I had to explain who came to see me that, no, I don't think the evidence is there that CBD is going to cure your cancer. However, if you go on the web, there are people that not only sell CBD oil on the Cure Your Own Cancer website, but you can get a Cure Your Own Cancer t-shirt with CBD on it. And, you know, I find that difficult as an oncologist. Right now, the wait to see me in my clinic is six months. And the most disturbing thing I see are people that have waited six months to see me who have a treatable cancer, potentially curable, who are taking cannabis oil in hopes that I'll tell them that that was the right thing to do. I'm still a conventional oncologist. Our treatment works for a lot of patients. I have no evidence that cannabis oil cures cancer. What are the studies showing? There are only two studies if you go to clinicaltrials.gov. Nabiximols or Sativex, the UK compound that's the whole plant extract, was compared with placebo in patients with recurrent glioblastoma, that most aggressive brain tumor. Uh, a small study, they only do small studies, 21 people, 12 got randomized to receive the, the medicine and nine got placebo. And the treated group, 83% survived for one year compared to only 53% of the group on placebo. So that was statistically significant. I think it warrants further study. Uh, 21 people, 12 on the treatment is not a huge group. Israel gets a lot of credit uh, for being at the forefront. I recently gave a talk similar to this in Uruguay. And uh, when I went to clinicaltrials.gov before that talk, I saw that the study was scheduled to have closed in July of 2015. And I was giving the talk, I believe it was in June of 16. So I sent an email to the principal investigator. I said, whatever happened to your 60-person study of CBD for recurrent cancers? And he said he was only able to enroll four people, three with brain tumors, one with another cancer, and he saw no effect. I just sent him another email saying, is this still going? I think it's closed. Uh, because it's not on uh, clinicaltrials.gov anymore. So as an oncologist, the thing that we worry about most of, for our patients using complementary therapies, particularly botanicals, is that there may be an interaction between that botanical and the chemotherapy that we're prescribing. So we know from small studies that may or may not be clinically relevant that cannabis tea with two chemotherapeutic agents produces no acute effect. But I don't know too many people using cannabis as a tea. And again, in mice, cannabinoids with chemotherapy seem to act synergistically to reduce tumor cell growth. And pancreatic cancer, one of our most difficult to treat, uh, when you combine cannabinoids with that chemotherapy that we used to use the most, again, it kills chemotherapy cells. I'm one of the editors of uh, the National Cancer Institute's Physician Data Query Complementary and Alternative Medicine website, which discusses cannabis and cannabinoids. And I urge any of you who are interested in keeping up on the latest data to visit this website, because every month they send me a packet of articles that needs to be reviewed to determine whether we should post that information or not. And it's cannabis in cancer symptoms, as well as cannabis uh, as an anti-cancer agent. When I go to uh, conferences where basic scientists talk about their work in animals, they often describe cannabis euphoria as a side effect of treatment. I don't think it's really, however, an adverse experience, especially in people suffering from a terminal illness. And then I say, is a single treatment that increases appetite, decreases nausea and vomiting, relieves pain, improves mood and sleep, a potentially useful symptom tool in symptom management and palliative care. I ask all of my cancer patients three questions before I examine them. What brings you joy? What are your hopes? And where does your strength come from? And the number of patients who answer that gardening brings them joy is not insignificant. I think if part of you is dying or you feel that you're dying, the ability to bring life out of the ground is a blessing. And if you can grow your own medicine, that's very empowering. 
Again, an Israeli study looked at 211 patients who were coming to get cannabis licenses. 113 came back for a second interview. 25 had stopped cannabis treatment after less than one week, and these were people more likely to have brain metastases and less likely to have chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, or weight. The 106 who continued are clearly a biased sample in this observational study, but they reported all cancer or treatment-related side effects were significantly improved, and these included nausea, vomiting, mood disorder, fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, sexual function, sleep, itching, and pain, and they were all statistically significant. 43% of the respondents said they reduced their pain medicines and a third reduced their antidepressants. <clears throat> so even our most conservative and august New England Journal of Medicine ran a, an, a sort of opinion piece, pro-con, uh, would you treat Marilyn, a six-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer who seeks cannabis to alleviate her symptoms, yes or no? And the two respondents, unfortunately, in the article were both mental health professionals. I say unfortunately because they both should have been oncologists. This is what happened that mental health professionals and particularly addiction medicine specialists are often the ones that are commenting about cannabis. And having been on safari, I can say that it's when you put an addiction medicine specialist and an oncologist, it's like we're touching different parts of the elephant because they only see the catastrophes and I see the benefit. So the New England Journal of Medicine was surprised by the outcome of polling in the blog that followed that article because 76% of all votes in favor of the use of marijuana for medical purposes even though marijuana use is illegal in most countries. And then WebMD did a survey of physicians in the United States, 1,500 physicians from 12 specialties in 48 states, and over two-thirds say that cannabis is useful. And I'm proud to be an oncologist because oncologists and hematologists had the highest level of support among medical specialists. The lowest, yep. <clears throat> The lowest was in rheumatologists who deal with patients with arthritis, which is clearly benefited, but still 52% of them felt that cannabis was useful. So when my oncology colleagues say to me, Donald, it's the 21st century. We have nanotechnology, genomic therapies. Why are you still studying a plant as medicine? I tell them it's to return to the roots of medicine. And with that, I say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrams. Thank you very much. You can go over there. You know, it's, what a pleasure to hear from someone who's right in the thick of, has been in the thick of HIV, like I was in a rural practice, and unfortunately, at that stage, I was ignorant, very ignorant of drugs, cannabis in particular. And people there, one could have, they could have grown their own medicine for HIV. But to have someone like Dr. Abrams, who's, who's done all the research, who's a hardcore scientist, and is also an integrative uh, medical specialist. And it's interesting that against all the odds, he's actually still managed to do some clinical trials. And that's the sadness now, because the laws prevent us from being doing big clinical trials which will give us the definitive evidence. But, um, so thank you, Dr. Abrams, and we now have a lunch break for an hour, so enjoy your lunch, please. Thank you. <laughs>